Well, the first memory I have of theatre um, was, I think, from the very late 70s or early 80s when I was involved in a play that was titled He Who Gets Slapped. The play was directed by an American lady named Joy and um, I was roped in by um, uh, Farida Marikan, who was the producer, to do the soundtrack the sound design and um, audio for the production for He Who Gets Slapped. And I, um, you know, I had never been involved in theatre be until then and I thought, okay, it's a nice way of getting uh, to know a new discipline and um, experience. So I said, okay, I did it. And um, one night, I think, I can't remember what the screw up was, but there was a slight screw up on audio and I remember that was my um, lasting experience of my first theatre experience, getting scolded by Joy Zinnemann, this very loud American lady who was very explicit in her choice of words to tell me off. And I remember I was so upset. How can you tell me off? I'm Patrick Dill. No, no. This big ego thing was still there, right? So uh, anyway, she told me, what a shitty job I was doing as the sound man. So that was my experience in theatre, my first experience in theatre. Yeah, of course, because, because it was the first time I'd, although by that time I had been on the radio for close to 20 years. So speaking to an audience was quite second nature to me, but it, theater was something brand new for the first time in my life I was standing on stage in a costume um, playing a character and having to say lines so of course I was very very nervous and excited and, and I enjoyed it very very much and that was the first time in my life I realized um, why for me theater was so exciting I think, yes, I received some advice from the director, uh, Joe, Joe Hashem. And I think I always remember what he said to me about how to curb stage fright nerves. What he basically told me was stage fright only happens backstage and in the wings. It never ever happens on stage. Because when you are on stage, you are actually doing what you have been practicing and rehearsing for a month or two or three. So once you step on stage and begin your line or you walk to your spot, your mark, you know that you have started the process of that scene. So you know, because you've been rehearsing it for so long, you know this leads to that, that leads to that, that leads to that. So when you know all that, there's no more space for stage fright. It only happens in the wings because you're not doing anything. You know, you're frightening yourself, so to speak. Yeah. So that, that, that would be, I think to me, that is still very sound advice for anybody who wants to try and control uh, stage fright. Yeah. I suppose when you break it all down to the basics, there's actually no difference at all. It's the medium. Of, uh, of the story that changes. Nothing else changes, right? In theater, you play a character, uh, you tell a story on stage in front of a live audience. On film and television, you are a character, you tell a story to the camera. And on the radio, you are a radio presenter, you tell a story of whatever topic you've chosen for the day to an audience who's out there in, um, in your, on your radio network. So basically, when you ask, what is the difference? The difference is merely the medium. Other than that, there's, I feel there's absolutely no difference at all. You're actually somebody, a character, telling a story to an audience and getting reactions. I suppose in the, in the same way as any normal person does, 
every actor will tell you, um, yeah, I don't care about review. I don't care about reviews. No. But they do. You know, you read a bad review. If you say you don't care, you must be made of stone. Somebody says you were lousy doing something. Yeah, we, we all react, I suppose, in the same way. We'll read a bad review. We'll then, when, if our friends are around, we'll say, ah, the baga doesn't know what he's talking about. But when we're alone, we will, most of us, I think, will read it and try and think, well, did I do that? Did I do what he said? And um, the more experienced of us, I suppose, will read it and file it away and, um, you know, take it as, as something that we can learn from, you know. Because good reviews, yeah, make you feel good. And <laughs> like a lot of actors, I will tell the camera, like, I never read reviews. <laughs> I do. I, rightly or wrongly, I believe that an actor's characterization of um, any role he's given is very, very dependent on the script. The writer of the script determines, I think, the performance that the actor can give. If you are a decent actor with a good script, you will do well. If you're a good actor with a shitty script, you will do nothing. I don't care whether you are Al Pacino or Anthony Hopkins or anybody or Daniel Day-Lewis. If the script is bad, you will be bad. In, my, um, in the years that I've been involved in theatre, there, there are three roles that um, uh, stick in my mind all these years. The first one was when I played uh, Creon in Antigone. Creon, as you know, was the king who sentenced uh, Antigone to die for defying his, his law about her brother's body being hung and so on and so forth. I enjoyed that role very much because it gave me the opportunity to play a character who in the, in the plot of the play is actually the bad guy, right? Everybody should hate him. Uh, and Antigone, of course, is the heroine of the piece. But when I started out rehearsals, I, what I did was I read the play and I looked at the character and I made a conscious decision that by the end of the play, I want the audience to see the inside of this character. Uh, and at the end of the play, I said, if I could, I would like to win the audience over to his side of the argument and hate Antigone instead. I don't know if the audience um, got, the, got that message, uh, but I felt at the end of the run that I think I did it. So basically, the question you asked me, what kind of roles uh, do I enjoy? Well, I enjoy... Uh, um, playing roles of characters, ca playing characters who are always um, the, um, not under, underdog, but um, misunderstood characters. Yeah. Shylock, I think, is a very misunderstood character. And, um, and um, so was Edward in Rex and, and, and um, uh, Creon in yes. Antigone. Yeah. Unlike many of my friends, I'm not a trained actor. I didn't go to, to acting, uh, through acting courses and, and stuff. So I don't know a lot of the technical stuff about how an actor prepares, blah, blah, blah. My process is like, you give me the script. Okay, I read it. I know the story and the character. Okay, the, I come to the first reading and we start. That, that's how I... I prepare whether it's a one-man show or um, it's, it's not. I, I don't, I have never thought of any different approaches. A lot of people, I, div I digress a little bit. A lot of people think, wow, Patrick is so old already. So he must have worked on so many plays and so many different directors. Actually, I haven't. If you really look at my, um, my, 
uh, resume, if you like, I have been only in a very small handful of plays. And the directors I've worked with can be counted in one hand. And as I look back on it myself, I, I realize that most of the directors I work with are actually friends of mine. 90% of the plays I've been involved with um, uh, uh, came about with my friend, the director, who says, Oi, are you free during this time? Would you like to be in a play? Oh, okay. You know? There are two, different, two types of directors. One, the director who tells you exactly what he wants you to do. The other one is the director who explains to you his, his uh, vision. Some directors are very set. If you ask me which one I prefer, I actually have no preference. I am what uh, I, I, I term a very lazy actor. I'm an actor, I, know my, I learn my lines, now I'll do what you want me to do, you know? Well, as far as production values are concerned, of course, you know, depending on the budget and whatever, production values do vary. Uh, but Shakespeare is such that you could do it in a toilet, it'll, it'll still be wonderful, you know? The other difference is, I suppose, the actors who are involved. I have seen productions with, uh, of Shakespeare uh, material with very young actors, which I really don't enjoy because, um, I mean, I don't mean this to sound bad, but you know, younger actors without the experience, without the, the, the um, years of life behind them, I, don't, I think cannot carry a lot of the characters that, that are in Shakespearean plays. Huh? I think my appeal isn't to the younger actors, but to producers and directors, if you like, um, to put on more Shakespearean productions and then get more experienced actors to play together with the younger actors so that together as a unit they can learn from each other, you know. Get the younger actors, I suppose, to be involved in other roles in the play and work with these people. I, I wouldn't say draw inspiration from, but like, like any normal person, I of course have favorite actors. I like the, the actors that a lot of people like, like uh, Spacey, Pacino, De Niro, uh, Daniel Day-Lewis, people like that. Actually, Pacino and De Niro, not so much Daniel Day-Lewis. They are the two people I've watched a lot of work on film, of course, and they are the two who um, reinforced my belief that the script is all important. The writer's words and the situation he puts the characters in determine the kind of performance from even people like Pacino and De Niro. My beef from many, many years ago, that started many years ago with theatre, is that uh, Malaysian theatre is, for me, too intellectual. I would like to see a you know, few more productions of, uh, of uh, Neil Simon or, you know. Theatre in Malaysia is still very elitist la, to, to the general public's uh, view, you know. Our efforts in trying to develop a theatre culture has advanced, yeah, but it's advancing very slowly. You know, it's not also not helped by the fact that theatre is not taught in school. So, you know, young Malaysians grow up without a theatre culture. We don't. We do have a lot of comedy. We don't do enough good comedy. We don't do enough good. Neil Simon, we don't do enough good, uh, you know, material like that. I have seen uh, theatre productions of, what I say, non-intellectual uh, kind of plays, which I think is any bit as good as going to watch a movie, you know? 
even better, some of them. But I'm a very common guy, la, like got beginning, middle, end. La. Okay, I go and see. If the play starts in the middle and then goes to the end and then goes to the beginning, I say, I don't. I cannot handle it. Wow, that's a very difficult question to answer. Where is our theatre scene? I have not been involved in theatre that much for the last decade or so, but from what I, I see and read, it seems theatres for the scene, when you say the scene, I suppose you mean the people who are involved in producing work, in uh, acting and backstage work and all that. The um, circle seems to have grown a little bit, you know, uh, in that more and more young people seem to be involved in doing it. Whether that translates into selling more and more tickets to the general public, I don't know. Because I still have this, this, this um, thought that whatever I see out in the, in the news about what's coming up, uh, what is this play about, it's still the, you know, which I wouldn't spend 60 bucks on. Uh. Well, the, it's not so much an advice, it's just common sense. If you want to start out in theatre, you must do it because you love the craft, not because you want to be famous. Fame and glamour is a byproduct of your honing of the craft. If you hone it to a level that's good enough, you will become famous. You don't even have to think about it. The opportunities will come if you're good, yeah? That, that's, I think that's the, it's not sagely advice, it's just common sense. A lot of the generation today is so much in a hurry, they just want the fame. And what came before that, they're not particularly interested. My argument with my more theatre-savvy friends has always been that. Why are musicals and comedy more popular, sell more tickets? They're the same thing, but they take place in a theatre, they're live performances, it's not a screen with projection, like a cinema. Why do they sell tickets and why does um, Merchant of Venice don't sell as many tickets? Because it is easy for people to accept a musical. I go in there, yeah, I know, they sing a song that I'm familiar with, or they tell a joke that's funny, I laugh. Theatre, I have to sit there after paying $70. Mm, why does he do that? Why didn't he do this? And at the end of it, I have to go and discuss with my friend over Te Tare, what do you think the meaning of the story was? Huh? At the moment, we are at the musical and comedy stage. So if you produce plays that appeal to what appeals to them in musicals and comedy, maybe we sell more tickets, I don't know. No, I still can't tell you what roles I would like to play. I, I would, you know, my criteria for being in a theatre production, like, like I told you earlier, do I know the director? Oh, it's now directing. Okay, I'll do it. And what is uh, the play about? It's um, about this. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Okay, I'll do it. That's, that's my criteria. <laughs> I suppose that's not very actor type, uh, but <laughs> that's me. I think the theatre community, as such, uh, is doing all it can admirably what theatre in Malaysia, and it is the same as in so many places around the world, is, is nobody wants to support it. And without corporate and government support, theatre is not going to develop at any faster rate. Than, I mean, okay, you look at a theatre country like England, UK, wow, thriving. But I think, if I'm not mistaken, in the early days, it was government support that kicked them off, you know. Singapore is doing the same thing. Here, our government makes a lot of noise and pays a lot of lip service, but there's no money. 
And if corporations, I believe, if corporations see that the government is not bothered, they're not going to bother. Like in Singapore, I believe corporations are very supportive because they know the government is very supportive. And if they are seen to be supportive as well, then yeah, in some way it will, it will rub off eventually. And yeah, in Malaysia, without that support, I think we will still be developing theatre at this snail pace for a long time. You know? Um, the vibe was different in the sense that I'm much older now and I've done it a few more times since the first uh, Man For All seasons. So I feel less nervous about the rehearsal process and about the character development and so on. The, the, the nerves before going on stage are still the same. Because if that ever changes, it's time for us to quit anyway, right? But um, after having said that, I mean, I also have to tell you, a few years ago, I worked with a director that I had never worked before, and I totally went to pieces. I couldn't do it. In fact, I had to pull out of the play. Up to today, I still don't know why. Um, I was... One of the big things that affected me on that production was pure intimidation. I was in a new environment, this was in Singapore. I had, I'm working with a director I had never worked with before. And uh, I was working against an, an actor. This actor, uh, Emma, is a very, very good actor. And she came to the first day of rehearsal already booked down. So I was like, uh? And the rehearsal process was very short, which is not something that I was used to at the time. So I remember during the three weeks that I, two weeks that I was rehearsing, I was, every night I had nightmares. I would break out in a cold sweat. My blood pressure would go out through the roof. And I was just a wreck, physically, mentally a wreck. So much so I had to go and see a psychologist. Um, but. At the end, I couldn't do it. I had to tell the production company, I had to pull out. And if you ask me why that happened, I still, up to today, I don't know. It's a feeling that I wish, I don't wish on anybody, you know. It was frightening, it was painful, it was just... And at the end of it, after uh, I tendered my resignation and had to make a public statement in the press that you know, the play is not opening because it was my fault. Blah, blah, blah. Then you have to deal with the, your own mental anguish of, of um, whether I can actually do it again after this. And um, subsequently, the director uh, of the other play found another actor and staged the play. And I told myself, asked myself, should I go and see this play? What happens if I go and see it and then I get even worse to say, this fellow is doing it, why couldn't you do it? You know? But I thought about it long and hard and I said, I want to go and see it. And thankfully, the guy who played the role that I was supposed to play, a big fuck up, so. I felt very much better. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs>